Since I've already talked about my process before, what I'll be talking about in this one is more of how I choose colors and move around on the color wheel by breaking down my major color decisions in this particular illustration. If you're having a hard time or have no idea how to move colors in the wheel, hopefully this will give you an idea of how to study and experiment on your own. So as you might already know, I usually start with a background color first because I use it as a reference point for how dark or light my character will be. In this illustration, my background color is a dark purple and I decided that I was gonna work from dark to light. So I chose this slightly dark pinkish purple color for the character. The reason I chose this color is I was already thinking of the dark skin colors that I want to see in the painting and the color that results when our natural skin color is affected by a cool purple ambient light. Naturally, her skin has an orangish hue and it is being influenced by the purple. So I pulled the hue towards purple but I stopped right about here and kept it desaturated. Meaning it's more gray than vivid purple because I didn't want even the darkest parts of the skin and shadow to be affected very strongly. Additionally, I also wanted the color of the shadows in general to be closer to the background. And that's another reason I chose this color for the character. I could have went with a lighter shade or a more desaturated one but I chose to work from dark to light with the intention to make it lighter later on when they add the other colors. Now this is the part where I usually decide the colors for the separate parts like the clothes, the hair, etc. But for this particular illustration, I decided to do the skin and the light at the same time. So what I'm thinking about here is not just the natural color of the skin but the color of it when it gets hit by the light. This is why I put a huge difference between the values of the parts in light and shadow. As you can see, the value jumps quite far. So at first, this shape was just one big circular blob of color, and then I cut it down according to the form of the body and how it would look when hit by light from the upper left side. Now that the main light shape for the skin is done, I think about the colors of the other parts. I also multitask here because I'm already thinking about the color that results when the light hits the natural color of the object. So the color I choose equals the natural color plus the light. Her hair is supposed to be pink and the light is close to white. So I try to find the halfway point between those two, but I make sure that the brightness of the hair is closer to the light range than the shadow range. The next thing I do is decide the colors for the parts in shadow. I do the same method here, which is to look for the halfway points in between the ranges that I'm working on. I'll give you an example. Take a look at the parts that are in shadow. There is a point where if I go any brighter than this, the color will look like the light is hitting it, and it doesn't look like it's in shadow anymore. And I'm trying to keep the light and shadow family separate, so if I'm trying to color something that's supposed to be in shadow, I'm gonna stick to this range where the colors are closer to darkness rather than light. I do the same for the light parts. If I wanted to add a little bit of darkness to the light parts, I make sure they're not as dark as the parts that are in shadow. I stick to the value range that is closer to the light. That is mostly the case unless I'm coloring areas like this part, for example, where the light has a hard time hitting the inner parts of her hair. These are where some ambient occlusion occurs, meaning light doesn't really reach the spaces in between those areas so they're that dark. These areas technically belong to the shadow family, but I like to add the really dark touches even in areas where light is dominant to add more depth to the piece. But I do this very sparingly and mostly only do it in small tight spaces. Sometimes I use dark lines to express these areas, like a lot of artists also do when they make the lines thicker, signifying the dark parts where there is less or little light. A helpful rule to remember is that the darkest color in light should be lighter than the lightest color in shadow. But I apply this rule for each separate part because each part's natural colors are all different. For example, the ribbon is naturally darker than her skin. Therefore, the comparison points in their respective light and shadow areas may be different for each of them. In other words, the ranges in which I can choose colors are different for each part. This is why I frequently check my values by toggling the color layer here as I discussed in one of my videos. Another thing that I find very helpful is the HSV window because it helps me adjust the colors more precisely. H moves the hues around, S moves horizontally and controls how much of the hue you want to show, also known as saturation, and V moves it vertically, which controls the brightness or darkness of the resulting color. I usually just move in the box, and if I want to make very tiny adjustments, that's when I usually go for these bars. But you should note that some hues are naturally darker than others, so take that into consideration when you adjust the saturation and brightness. 
An equally saturated and light blue is actually darker than an equally saturated and light yellow. I didn't move vertically, I didn't move horizontally, I just moved the hue. But when you look at these two colors in black and white, they're very different. So when you're looking at the drawing in color or as is, even if the V here says it's the same brightness, it may or may not be depending on the hue and saturation as well. This is why I recommend using the black and white toggle thing to check, especially if you're a beginner. I also recommend remembering which hues have lighter ranges and which ones have darker ranges. Following the rule I said earlier, if I want to lighten these colors in the shadow, I can only choose colors that fall into this value range. So for example, the white in these parts in shadow is not the same as the ones in the light. When you look from afar, they kind of look the same, and they both look white, but they really aren't. The values are drastically different. To add to that, these two are not entirely white. They're more like a shade of pink that just look white because they're placed between colors that make them look lighter than they actually are. I'll give you an example. This square in the middle is in pure white. It just looks relatively lighter compared to the colors that surround it. To prove it, I'll remove the colors beside it. Now the color in the middle looks like a very desaturated pink. I'll give you another example. This time, the one in the middle is darker. It looks black to me, but when I remove the colors beside it, it's not actually black. It is a desaturated dark purple. It just looked black because the other colors were much lighter compared to it. Now that the background color is pure black, this one in the middle looks like purple, and it's now lighter than the colors on the sides. I didn't change the color in the middle in both examples, I just changed the ones on the sides, yet it looks different in both instances. The trick here is really just the value of one color in comparison with the others. You should always consider how light or dark a color will look when placed next to other colors. We're looking for a reference point to compare with here. Something doesn't have to be pure white in order to look white. In fact, pure white will look out of place in a painting that isn't very bright, like this one. The same rule of having a reference point of comparison also applies when you want to change hues. If I wanted to make her hair look orange here, I don't necessarily have to pick orange. I just have to move the color towards orange. You can see that even if her hair tips look orange, when I use the eyedropper tool, they're more on the red side. The reason why this looks orange enough to me is because 1. It's desaturated, meaning I took away the vividness of the pink, and 2. I'm moving the hue towards orange and away from pink. Well, why didn't I just pick orange? If I pick a saturated orange here, it's gonna stand out too much, so I decided not to. But that's just a personal preference because I wanted to maintain a cooler palette. It's important to note that in all of these instances, I always consider the value or the brightness or darkness of a color whenever I pick colors. Note that you add darkness by moving right, moving down, and changing hue. Conversely, you add lightness by moving left, moving up, and changing hue. You can use or combine any of these movements in either case. Throughout this whole painting, I repeat the process of looking for points in between the lightest and the darkest parts and adding lightness or darkness within a reasonable range, like I demonstrated earlier through my examples. If I want to add something brighter or darker than what I first put down, I do so but I set reference points to compare with to decide how bright or dark I can go, and I keep the distinction I have between the light and shadow family, no matter how much I adjust the contrast or the difference between them. I hope I help you gain some insight on how I choose my colors. Feel free to color pick the colors in my art and study how they move, study the changes in value, like how I analyze my own decisions in this illustration.